happens on God's best. Can you say it with me, please? Come on. God's best. One more time. Say it again. Come on. God's best. Now, in our, in our time together in these next three sermons, we're going to look at what to avoid. In life, there are some things, if you avoid these things, you will not have certain problems. But if you don't avoid them, you will. And so the question is, what should you avoid? What are the things you should say, well, I don't want to ever have that in my life, ever, 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 ever in my life. And there are three things to avoid. Say them with me, please say, say naive thinking. Now, this is really a hard term. I just made it up kind of like the historical, historically blind thinking. Come on. Historically blind thinking, which means something that happened in your past, in your history, that you now are blind to. You act like it didn't happen. So you're having historical blindness. You knew about this. You lived it. You went through it. Um, and you can relate to it. For example, you had a bunch of debt before. Got out of debt. Now you're back in it again. What happened? Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Okay. Then we're going to talk about a foolish thinking. Can you say it with me, please? Come on. Foolish, foolish thinking. thinking. So I want you to avoid naive thinking, avoid historically blind thinking, and avoid foolish thinking. Those are the three teachings we're going to do together. So next week we'll pick up on the historically blind part. And then after that we'll do the one called foolish thinking. Now, what I want you to notice with me is when you get the notes, you'll see this thinking today is all about one guy and his family. His name is Eli. Now, on Sundays, I am teaching on Samuel. And if you've noticed, I'm in 1 Samuel for the month. And the goal of this is to fall in line with our series for the year, which is improve your thinking. If you want to protect your future, you have to improve the way you think. If you don't change the way you think, you can't improve your life. You can pray, you can talk in tongues, you can fall out, you can cry, you can worship, you can do all of that. But it's not just about that. That's important. I'm a big believer in that. I, I'm such a worshiper, especially in my private life and in my home life and late night and up late. I mean, I have, I have hour-long worship sessions. I just sing and worship God, pray a lot. I'm big. If you live with me, if you work around me, you know that's true. He's always praying. He's always reading something. And I really believe that that helps me stay sane in my brain because my brain gets out of the way in the morning time and at night time. And I've learned that in order to improve the quality of my life, I must improve the way I think. That's why I love our book, The War on, um, what am I forgetting, it, Sheila? What's wrong? Winning, <laughs> Winning the War of the Mind. It's a lot going on up here, I'm telling you. Winning the War of the Mind by Craig Rochelle. It's a really great book. It really says a lot, and you need to get it if you haven't. And, and the... This Saturday is our book, um, you, and you don't have to read the book. If you didn't read the book, come anyway. It's fun. Uh, we have brunch. It's free food. Wow, that's really cool, right? Brunch and books, and it's really great, and we are doing that book, and we're getting ready to launch a brand new book. We're going to launch two books. Say two. Two, two. two books for the summer. We're going to give you something to read with us, and you're going to love those, and I'll tell you about those. One is called Accidental Pharisee, how you became a Pharisee by accident. <laughs> and, 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 and I haven't even read it all yet, so I'm really excited about it because the title and the, the read about the book is really great. And then there's another one that we're going to throw in the pot, too. We've done a review of it before, but it's called The Adult Children of Immature Parents. Yeah, yeah, both books. And so it's going to be two. I told you, it's two books. We're going to roll, girl. We're rolling. That's right. And, and you can pick, you know, read them at your own pace. Pick which one you want to read first. And then we'll end up coming back and we'll have throughout the next several months, we'll let you know when we're going to talk about each one. But I'm really excited about both. And one thing I want to do is have a session with parents, um, just parents, and I'm going to talk to you about this issue. And I may even do one of the third Sundays on that. We'll see. But I want to do a session with just parents and say, let's talk about this book. And I want to just talk about what this means and how it all relates. And, and so I'll tell you all about that. But at least I'm trying. Tell your neighbor, say, he's trying. Come on, he's trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. You can't say I'm not trying. All right, let's get to it. So today we start with our, our topic, uh, naive thinking. It's in 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse, verse 12. Eli was the head priest in Israel at this time. And it's an interesting book because it chronicles Eli's journey. It's in the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel is going to become the, the priest eventually. But he is discipled by a guy named Eli. Eli's sons have all gone wild. And his, his whole tenure has gone off the cliff. 
It's a church gone wild. That's what it is. And these were the main people. And it's interesting. Um, and, 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 and when God decided to establish the ministry of uh, the priesthood, he came up with this incredible system. And the system was pretty simple. The, the system said, we're going to have these group, this group of people who are dedicated to making sure you are taken care of spiritually. And they were called Levites. And so all the other tribes were given assignments and land and told, you know, you just the tribe that handles the warfare, this is the tribe. And everybody had an assignment. But Levites were designed to just take care of the temple. And so they handled the worship, they handled the worship, the prayer. And he said that basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys, you have no inheritance in the land, which means when they give out the land, you don't get any of the land. The tithe is your inheritance. That's what he told them. The tithe was established to fund full-time ministry because you really can't serve. There were three million people. You couldn't serve that many people part-time. Part-time ministry works okay, but when you start serving thousands of people, when it becomes more complicated, you need people who are there all the time because you never know when people have a need. So the Levites were established, and so Eli was a Levite. He was one of those who was established, and so he was full-time, and his sons were full-time. His whole family was in it, and so watch what happens. Eli's sons were scoundrels, though. <laughs> Verse 12. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priest that whenever any one of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled. Now you're going to pause there for a minute because you're a little bit confused what's happening. Well, please understand, they were offering sacrifice. They didn't give, they didn't give money. There was special events where they gave gold and silver to build a tabernacle, but it was ma mainly exchanges of, of meat and product. So when you, had, uh, when you came to offer a sacrifice, you brought your sacrifice. Well, there was a way you did it, and there was a process. And what they were doing was basically stealing the meat. That's what they were doing. So you put your offering in, and they say, hey, give me some of that. And they stick their fork in it and take it first. And they say, well, it didn't, it didn't finish boiling yet. It didn't finish being offered to the Lord. They say, well, it's, it, we don't care about that. And they, they literally took meat from people. They took the sacrifices, and people would hate going. Watch what it says. It says, and, and, and they would plunge the fork into the pan or, pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. And, and sometimes it's supposed to be a burnt offering, and it's supposed to burn all the way up, and they didn't care. They said, no, nah, I want them. Let that burn up. That's mine. And they would, they would, take, they would take the sacrifice. Well, verse, um, it goes on to say, Eli's children stole the best of the meat. Uh, this is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat uh, to roast. He wouldn't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. So he, they would even stop people from offering the sacrifice. While it was raw, they would take it. It's amazing. Verse 16, if the person said to him, let the fat be burned first, then, then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no. Hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. Now, this is, this is, this is gangbanging in church. <laughs> this, is, this is terrible. Watch what happens. Verse 17. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. It's just, it's just a tragic moment. Now, what's really sad is Eli knew it. Look at verse 22. Now, Eli was, was very old and heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women. Uh-oh. See, it starts with one problem. Before you know it, then move something else. Now they're looking at all the people. Oh, look at her. And so now you got them sleeping with all the people. What in the world are you doing in church? You ever wondered that? You ever wondered what happened? How do you get like this? So it, it, it goes on. Now, verse 23, he confronts them, and he says this. He said to them, why do you do such things? I hear what you guys are doing. Let me paraphrase it. I hear what you're doing. Why are you being bad? The Lord sees what you're doing. Okay, this is good. This is a good speech. It's, it sounds great. He said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. 
Now, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. This is good. This is a good start. You ready? If one person sins against another, God may mediate from the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, this sermon is really good. I like it. He's on the road. Who will intercede for them? But the sons did not listen to their father's rebuke. Well, let me not read the last part yet. Let me just tell you this. Words are fine, but there's a time for action. This is an example of a church gone wild. And the, all the leader is doing is talking. Here's what he should have said. You and you no longer have a job. You and you no longer will be able to do this any longer. That's what he should have said. When all the people, he said, all the people are telling me. Okay, so you know. You know what's amazing is what people know. And they, they just tolerate it. And it, you don't offend anybody and, you know, all that. And so they just let it go on. Now, here's what is said in the Bible. I must read it because it's in the Bible. And I didn't write it, but it's interesting. Here's what it says. For it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Well, now that's just painful to hear. So it was almost like, well, you know, hey, um, you know, these two guys are in trouble. Verse goes on here in verse 25. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be a sign to you, he's told in verse 34. In verse 34, God talks to Eli and says, and I'm not going to read all of it, but he says basically, what your sons, he names them, Hophni and Phinehas, has done will be a sign. I'm going to use them as an example. They will both die in one day, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. This is in chapter 2, verse 34, and now verse 35. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish my priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. In other words, your family members are going to say, give us our jobs back. It's not going to just be you. I want you to watch what he said. He said, uh, your family line. When you do certain things, you create generational issues. You know what's interesting about crime? It's generational. The cousin teaches the other cousin to sell drugs, and they teach the nephew to sell drugs, and they teach the uncle to sell. Everybody, it's this family thing. When you go in the police department in those little areas where they have special areas, if you ever get to go, you probably won't, but if you ever get to go, they got, they got the whole family up there. And they got the family and the friends and all the people up there, and they say, okay, this one taught this one. And they know, they know all kind of stuff. It's really amazing. I, I, I um. I'm, I'm amazed at what people know. And what I've seen in my own experience is it's family-oriented. It becomes generational. They teach their children how to shoplift. They teach their daughters how to shoplift. They teach them how to cuss. They teach them how to lie. They teach them how to do all that. They them, teach them how to handle men, how to handle women. They teach, all that's taught, and, and, and there's almost like classes. Lust 101, line 104, advanced line. Drug and drink. I mean, it's, it's a you're teaching your kids a class. And so, before I get the Q&A down the road here, I promise I'm coming to you in the chest and a few questions. And make notes if you have questions online or in person, okay? Make notes. We're going to take a few questions in just a little bit. So, in about uh, 15 minutes. So, hang with us. Just a few more minutes. So, the changing of the generation. So, what happens in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel? In chapter 3, God decides to fire everybody. And what he does is he brings up this guy named Samuel. He's a young kid. And Samuel is the daughter of um, Hannah. We talked about her on Sunday. And we talked about how Hannah had a son, and his name was Samuel. And she said, if you give me a son, she couldn't have children. She said, I would offer him to the Lord. And so Samuel is the, is, is the, is the child that comes from her. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 8, uh, the Lord starts talking to Samuel. And I want to jump into the conversation. And he's a little fella, and he doesn't really know what's happening. He's never really heard the voice of God or anything. And he's hearing this voice. And so th this is the third time I'm jumping into the conversation now. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 8. A third time the Lord calls Samuel. 
And Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, hey, here, here I am called. Did you call me? And, and that, at that moment, Eli, the Bible said, realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you again, say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there and calling at, as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. This is the, the, the first spiritual lesson that Samuel gets to encounter God. Now, what's going to happen is powerful. God's not going to just, he just spoke, he spoke to Samuel, but he's going to warn him. God's going to use Samuel to warn Eli. Now, I want you to listen to this. This is, this is strong, verse 11. The Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it uh, about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to the end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever. I, I want you to pause there for a minute. Forever. Say that word, please. Come on. Forever, because of the sin he knew about. This is not a family. And by the way, I want you to notice this for a minute. Samuel's going to go tell Eli this. And what I want you to, and you can read it on your own in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. Eli never repents. Eli never says, oh, man, I'm so sorry. You know, you remember in Jonah after, <laughs> I love the story of Jonah. I just love the story. It's a great story. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he doesn't like the Ninevites. And so when he goes to Nineveh and he tells the Ninevites, you know, God's going to judge you. God's going to get you. And the Ninevites all repent. And Jonah says, oh, man, I knew you would forgive him, right? This is a hard, funny story. I always think it's funny because Jonah knew that, that God would forgive them. And so here we have Eli being told, God's mad with you. God's upset with you. And he never ever says, oh, I'm so sorry, God, I, I repent. Never. I'll go fire my sons right now. He ne never, never. Some people will not change. I hope you're not one of those people. I mean, this is powerful because he would never change. So here's what he does. He tells Samuel. Samuel is, tells Eli eventually. He said for verse 13, for I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. That's the problem. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. He can't have enough sacrifice. He can't, it can't be atoned for. This is a guy who refuses to change. Say that with me, please. Come on. This is a guy who refuses to change. Say it again. Come on. This is a guy who refuses to change. This is a person who won't change. He won't change, no matter what. That's a scary place to be because the next step is God replaces him. Here's what I believe. God will replace Ricky Temple. I am not irreplaceable. I know too many guys <laughs> and gals who have been replaced. And, and what, I want you to notice what got them there. Their, their, moral, their sexual moral decisions got them there. Their lack of discipline got them there. The, the lack of accountability got them there. The lack of willingness to confront things got them there. And because they wouldn't confront things, because they would allow things to go on, then notice what God says. I will never, this is powerful. The guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. You can't ask me enough. See, there is a line that is drawn. And I think we, we don't believe that, but it is a line drawn. And so... Eventually, Eli is replaced. Samuel becomes a prophet. But then what's interesting is as you read on in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, you see another trend. Bad thinking becomes part of the culture if you're not careful. So let's say you live through a bad experience. You go to a bad church. A church that turns bad. Things go bad or whatever. And you, or you see it in your family. And you say, oh, that was horrible. I'm going to be different. You've heard those words? I am going to be different. Well, what you start seeing, if you look close, is they didn't get rid of all the bad habits. One of the great studies in the Bible is in the book of um, Judges. Because in the book of Judges, it's Joshua and the Judges. What you see is Israel went halfway in certain areas. They would half conquer a city, half conquer a town. They would not go all the way. We have a tendency to be partial in our commitments. 
to God. And it's obvious. It's obvious. I mean, you can see it in a bunch of areas. Um, if I were to pick on a couple of them, uh, volunteerism, we don't serve. We come to church and we enjoy being blessed, but we don't, we will never, we don't take what we get and give it to anybody. There's nobody that would say you brought them the gospel or, or served it for free in any capacity. Um, I really believe I have to be a servant. Somebody needs to be able to testify for me and say, Ricky Temple, help me. And it can't be my children. It's got to be somebody else. Who else would testify? We don't, our money, if you look at our money, this is the truth. I looked it up till today to be sure. 60% of people give nothing in church. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. And I, you know, I mean, hey, you know, it's up to you, but I, I think that's amazing. I think if you look at your giving record and say, what did I give last year? You're going to look at it and say, what did I give last year? What was, what was my total? It was $210 for the year. Jesus, help me, God. And I'm not, I understand, people have issues. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just making a point. If you look at life, you see people who, this is my life, and this is what, what God has to accept, and this is how we are in relationship with people. There's some people who borrow money from you, you know what I'm talking about, right? And they never, ever pay you back, and they always come for more. It's hilarious. It's like you're a bank or something. And they're confused when you say no. What do you mean No. Didn't you get paid as a 15th, right? Don't you have that? Didn't you say you got a, you got, you got a, a check coming for, for uh, taxes or something? You were testifying about you got 5,000 coming back. All I need is three. You at least have two left. And they still owe you five from, like, you, you see what I'm saying? So there's this whole way they think that is amazing. That, that it's amazing. They live in your house and they complain about your rules, like, Pick up your trash or contribute. You know, there's, or don't be loud or don't come in all times of night. It's like they can do what they want. And so you, you, God's saying, you know, this is how Eli is. This is a guy who will not change. No matter what I say, no matter how I say it, he has decided that God has accepted. And that's like Cain. You remember the Bible talked about Cain and Abel? And they called it the way of Cain. Cain says, God, listen, I know you said you want a blood sacrifice, but we're not doing that today. Abel, my brother, kills stuff. No, he, got, he, got all, he got the animals. I ain't got no animals. I got, I got some trees. I got some potatoes. I got some tomatoes. Some lettuce. Okay? A few grapes. That's what I'm going to bring to the sacrifice. He said, that's not what I told you to bring. And Cain said, well, hey, forget it. I ain't bringing nothing. To and then he kills Abel because he's mad. There are people like that. There is a jail for a reason. <laughs> I'm serious. There are people, that's the only place they can live because they can, if they live among us, they're going to do it. They're going to do things to us because they refuse to stop. That's what Eli's like. Let me keep going. So I'm going to show you something. This is, this is kind of a little side observation. This is chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, okay? So in chapter 4, they run up. So Eli's now, Samuel is now in charge, right? So Samuel takes over, and there is, the, well, Eli's really in charge still. But there's this, this, this fight breaks out. And when the fight breaks out with a group called the Philistines, uh, that's when you start seeing some of the problems, some of the ways of thinking. Remember, that's what we talked about, naive thinking. Now here's, here's, here's the point I want to make. Eli was naive in his thinking because he thought he had a pass. The rules didn't apply to him. Be careful of people like that. Okay. And the, so they were, they were naive thinking they had a pass. And they also redefined things. God gave them this thing called the Ark of the Covenant as part of their worship. So I described it to you last week. It was a box, right? Put the box, cut the box in half. On the front side of this box would be called the holy place. On the back part of the box would be called the Holy of Holies. Okay? And inside of the Holy of Holies, you can only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. The holy place you go once a week. So there's this whole worship process. I'm not going to describe it all, but that's basically what it was. And there was this curtain in between. When Jesus died, the curtain was lifted. So now you can go straight to the Holy of Holies. You didn't have to go once a year, no Day of Atonement. Jesus was the atonement for our sins. Can I get an amen? So that's all cool stuff, right? 
Well, the Ark of the Covenant was part of their, you know, their, their, their life. But they decided they were going to go fight the Philistines, but they were afraid. So what did they do? We're going to take the Ark with us like a lucky charm. Now, the Ark wasn't supposed to be a lucky charm. God never told them to take the Ark to battle. But they take the Ark to battle, and then they lose it. Now, it's, a, it's an amazing story. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 4, verse 2, the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord uh, bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies, like a lucky charm. So the people sent Shallow, they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned before the cherubim and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it seemed like he would have said, no, we can't do this. See, when you have leadership, they don't want to speak up, and they allow you to do stuff. This was the point, this is the way he should have led. This is where you see it again. He's, he's letting his sons do things, now he's letting the people do things. Let me say it again. He's letting his sons do things, now he's letting people do things. You've been in ministries, you've seen all this stuff before. And it, it's, it's like, well, who's going to say something? Well, watch what happens. It said when they got there, I'm going to skip down to verse, uh, first, first, uh, Samuel 4, I'm going to go down to verse 10. So the Philistines fought and Israel were defeated. Every man fled to his tent. They slaughtered, uh, slaughter, was, slaughter, slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured. And Eli and Hophni and Phinehas died. Now, this all happened in one day. Let me describe it to you. You can read it all on your own. It's in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4. The family of Eli's four family members die in one day. Eli's sons die in chapter 4, verse 11. Eli, when he heard the news, he fell back and broke his neck, chapter 4, verse 18. He died. Eli, <laughs> his daughter-in-law died having childbirth in chapter 4, verse 19. The whole family. All of a sudden, everything happens. Now, here's what's important. Samuel watches this. He's on the front row. Here's a question. What have you seen? What have you been on the front row of in your life? What would you say? I know what happens when you do this and that. I don't know what your this and that is, but you got a testimony. What have you seen and what have you ignored? I can tell you what I've seen. I've seen people, as my mom used to always say, live in a circle. Get paid, broke the next day, borrowed money, live in the circle. I've seen people get drunk, drink, get high. That's why I don't drink anything, because I know I like it. I tell you all that. You're going to have a drunk preacher. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to be a wine bibber. I'm going to be drinking in the middle of the sermon. So, oh, yeah, hold on for that. I'm going to be sipping. I'm going to tell you right now. You don't want me to start. So just say, no, don't give me anything. Don't give me anything. <laughs> I have not seen anybody in my family. It's destroyed. It went through the men of my family like a, like a tornado. I mean like a tornado. It, I mean they look, they look toe up from the blow up. And it's all because of alcohol. There's some women in the family, too. Toe up from the floor. I'm staying sober so I can see what's happening. I need to be clear in my, I'm howling myself right now. I'm howling, I'm howling life. I laugh and I'm always, I tell you, I enjoy it. I, I, if you've been around me, you know I'm telling the truth. I, I, don't, I don't need anything. Say, oh, he don't need anything. He all by himself. He's okay. <laughs> we try to contain him like he is. But I'm telling you, it, 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 really, it really was sad. I mean, this is, but you've seen this. I don't know what you've seen. You've seen it. I've seen people, you know, lust just drown them. They just sleep with everybody. Just all over the place. They get everybody, everybody, just everybody, anybody, everybody, everybody. Just party. And then I, I seen them party. I seen the party. Go just, I've seen it. Come home all cut up and stabbed up and, and shot up in the hospital. Land, they almost dead. And then how'd the party go? You almost dead. Why are you asking about the party? I mean, I've seen this. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen the women look just as beautiful, just as beautiful. And then you get her home, you got Cruella de Vil. I've seen all that. I've seen that. I've seen, I've seen that the men look like he's a hard, deep voice, and lazy as can be, won't even pick up behind himself. I've seen it. 
I've seen it. And so I've decided to say something. I've decided to be different every day. I'm looking at things right now. I see people, they're going out. They ain't taking care of themselves. They're exercising, not eating right. I'm trying. I'm going to push up a little bit at night, do something. I'm, I'm seeing them go down. They're going, they're falling one by one. Boy, I tell you, I'm t- I lost some weight. The devil started coming back again. Ooh, coming back on me again. Let me, let me go some more. Let me try again. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, it's just, I say, have you seen it? Have you been to the hospital? You need to just go in there and you just walk around and take a tour. Walk around. So let me see. Which one am I going to be? Which one will I be in, Jesus, if I don't do better than this? And you know you're going to be a bad patient. You're going to be screaming. They're going to be, cause I used to work in the hospital. I'm going to say this. I'm going to do questions. I used to be in the hospital. And you know, the patients who scream all the time, you ignore them. They do now. I'm just telling you what I saw. Ah! They go hellin' again. They go hellin'. They go hellin'. And I'm back there screaming again. Ah! And then I go in there, you know, I say, hey, Miss Helen, why are you screaming? They ain't coming here yet. And then she started cussing. I said, Miss Helen, that's why they ain't coming. You cuss them, see? And I got slapped two or three times. No, I did. I just slapped me in my face. Pow, you a handsome young man. I said, okay. That's not nice to slap people, Miss Helen. You should slap people. Slap me again in my face, full cold, pow. See? And I, I, I left out there, too. I didn't go back in there either. I said, I ain't going to go. Y'all going to have to get somebody else to transfer Miss Helen because she swing too much. She be beating people up. I mean, I just, you know, if you see it coming, why not do something about this? Eli saw it coming. Samuel watched it. And so next week, we're going to talk about how in the world could he see all of that and fall in the same trap? How could you, seeing all you've seen in your family, fall in the same trap? You should take them cigarettes and squash them down. You just see, you haven't seen people breathing. You didn't see that? That long cord around the house, you didn't see that? You want a cord? I saw somebody today, he's like, this is a puffin, this is a, I said, ooh, Jesus. I'm not doing that to my lungs. I'm sorry. I'm not putting you down if you smoke. I'm just simply saying, come on now. I understand. I know it's a hard habit to break. I never had it. I tried it one time, and I didn't do well, so I never kept on. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, 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 need, you need to pause. You can read this Bible and say, oh, that's a story. I like that. But you need to look in the mirror. Are you more like Eli than you want to admit? At some point, you have to pause. And I'm going to pause right there, 32 minutes. We got... Ten more minutes plus some change. If uh, you got a question about anything I've said tonight, anything that I've said you thought was fascinating, interesting, in a Bible study, you got to talk a little bit. So you get to ask me a question. Anything you, you thought about, or, or you said, Pastor Rick, tell me about that. I want to I wanna understand that. Um, and so get me a fire away. Somebody start me off. What, what kind of questions, thoughts? Um, what Ask did I say was fascinating? You want to start off? Should yes. You what you got? If you're um, online, if you're online, just type in your question. Staff will see it, and they'll pass it on to me, okay, if you're online. What are some things that um, you're talking about, why people never get to their dream, and uh, being the leader and different choices that you have to make, and one of the things, of course, being naive thinking, we've talked about that tonight, but what are some things that uh, you can share as a CEO or leader that you've been naive about as it relates to leading an organization, (laughs) just to get us started? Ooh, wow, that's a good one. Naive about money? Naive about being courageous enough to really ask you to give because so, so that we'd be empowered to be able to do good. Um, you know, um, naive about how fast time goes. You just, it's, it, for, you keep talking and planning, and if you don't do something, you'll just plan all your life and never do anything. Uh, naive about who's going to stay with you. Uh, I thought that certain people would be here forever, and and some of them have been here for 10, 15 years, but they get tired after a while. <laughs> and they have to move on. You know, they're, they're tired. They heard my best sermons. They got to go to another church and try another guy, you know, or whoever they want to hear. I just understand. I, I was naive about my age. Um, I, I, I just love martial arts, right? And, um, <laughs> and so I, I had a guy who used to come here and we used to work out like twice a week. And, um, and, and um, we're doing roundhouse kicks. And... <laughs> 
And he brought a, a, a was it a bag? It was bag. It was just, just mitts in his hand, right? So he, his hand, I kick his hand or whatever. And uh, I ain't going to do it today, trust me. But anyway, he, uh, <laughs> he, he I, I, my knee, no, no, we were hitting bags. No, steady, steady bags, the bag, you know. And, and I threw a roundhouse kick and hit the bag, and my knee hurt. I said, oh, Jesus. He said, well, how are you going to do that, Pastor Rick? We ain't even fight yet. He said, you got hurt before we fight. <laughs> the bag already won. <laughs> you know what I forgot? I was 41. I wasn't 21. So now I'm 65, so I really just talk to the bag. Hey, <laughs> can we negotiate? <laughs> or maybe go back in my mind on my skills. Just kind of keep me, keep me, you know. But my, my point is I didn't, I was naive about my age. I didn't realize time was moving. And it was. That's a few things. Somebody does have a question for me. Okay, keep rolling. Let's talk about uh, this concept of uh, a best life. It's a real contemporary term. You know, I'm living my best life, and it looks like I go on vacation when I get ready. I live in the house I want. I do all these other wonderful things. But can you sort of reconcile the worldly view, view of a best life versus the biblical view when you say in you know, God wants us to live our best life. What does that look like? Let me, let me take that a little, turn it to the left a little bit and say, let me respond this way. What surprises me about the best life is that once you get the best things, those things run out of steam too. So I'm not looking for another house. I got a nice house. I'm not looking for another wife. I got a great wife. I'm not looking for, you start, once those things are all in your hand, uh, once you have a certain number of children, I don't know what that number is, but once you get to that number, <laughs> some of you say it was one, it was two, it was no more, I don't know what the number is. You, didn't, you don't even think about more children. That completely leaves your mind. Once you get to a certain level of academic accomplishment, you don't think about going back to school again. Not like that. You're done. Like, you know, you're finished. <laughs> you don't want no more tests, no more, no more quizzes, books to read. And so... Uh, I, I think that your definitions of success evolve and mature, and you start seeing it differently. So what is God's best life for you is for you to come to that realization. I think when you come to the realization that life does not consist in the abundance of things that you possess, Jesus said. It's just not. I mean, it's just not. This is the honest truth. I mean, it's with all my heart. I'm not just saying this because she's here. Diane is the best all I wanted in a woman. She's got, she rolling, she got it all. She wrote, she, now there's some things that came along with the package I didn't expect. <laughs> I want to be clear, I want to make sure you don't fool you now. <laughs> okay, there's a couple of surprises in there. Maybe a few dozen surprises at times. You know, you know what she does? We watch basketball, she's loud. Oh my God, she's, oh, what? What? You know, I got them all, you know, I said, you just, I just, see, I'm quiet. I want to just sit there and listen to the game. I don't say nothing the whole game. I'm just quiet because I'm not in there, but you think she's in the game. That girl is into that thing. I mean, and so she told me the other day, we have this little movie room in our house. She said, okay, I'm coming in here. And I'm watching the game. And I'm going to be very loud. So you got a lot of TVs in this house. You can go watch if you don't want me to be loud. Man, she was all over that game. She was <laughs> all over it. You out of here. Rebound! I said, okay, baby. He's trying. He's trying. You know, anyway. But that's a surprise. I got some marking there, but that's the only one I'm going to say today. But my point is, once, once, once you get to that place, God wanted me to understand, a woman can't give you all joy. I always say there's only so much joy you can get from a good man, a good woman, a marriage, a relationship, a church, or pastoring, and thousands of people. It doesn't matter. It, being on television, there's only so much joy in being on TV. There's only so much joy and being recognized all the time. People just don't always understand that. So, so you, you get to decide what your best life looks like? Pretty much. I think you do. I think that God, you know, I love the question that Jesus asked the disciples. What do you wish? They came to him. He said, what do you want? They said, we want to sit on your left hand or right hand. He said, okay, I just can't give it to you. It's only for people who, who are prepared for it. There are certain people that are, this is prepared for me. I, I'm, God called me to this job. You can't just have it because you want it. So I do think that, that you get to choose, but I don't think, I'll, I don't think, what I don't think is, I don't think I always know what the best life is. All right, well, I think we got a question in the back. Questions right? on it? Okay, monitor. Monitor on the, I can't, I can't see it on the monitor. It's, it's not here. Read it. 
Read it, take that back to the dime, would you please? And then we'll, we'll, we got it. Okay, we got somebody coming back there. What's that question, Diane? Somebody online, what you got? Uh, yes, someone online said, why do you think Eli did not repent? He thought he had a pass. Like we do. Eli's a lot like us. What have you not done that you know you should have done? Why didn't you do it? You thought you had a pass. You thought, well, I, I just didn't want to do it. I just didn't do it. So here, we got another question over here on, on the left. Okay. Yes. I guess it gets back to human nature, but Eli, from what I'm reading, had a very direct relationship with God. I mm -hmm. mean, he's telling Samuel, God's talking to you. Right. He doesn't talk to us like that today. I can't understand why Eli would be so stupid, for <laughs> lack of a better word. You call it naive. I call it just stupid. <laughs> but you know what I think? I think he does speak to us like that because there are things you could say in your life that you personally knew came from God. Nobody else might have heard it. The, the, in the Bible, you just have him writing it out. But I can think of times when the Holy Spirit would say to me, don't eat that. I feel or I would, you know, stop being that way or don't in the middle of an argument. Stop. You're wrong. Just say you're wrong. Just back up and you just keep going anyway. So I think we can relate to Eli. But it, when you read it in the Bible, it is profound. But you can go back and say um, you and you know people um, and so and so was about to go down the aisle and it came to their mind. Run. Don't marry this person. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you know, there are people who would say that, right? Have you, what question, have you ever dated somebody, and in the middle of the date, you knew early on, oh, this is not good, but you thought you can fix them? That was the Lord right there saying, hey, don't you see this? They said, I will not work, nor clean, nor help in any way. That is your responsibility, not mine. They said that to you, and you felt the spirit saying, run. But they look good, so you stayed. We all got a story like Eli. <laughs> all right, yes. We have another one online. Uh, what is your advice about dreaming again at a senior level, and to how do you activate that dream? I think you activate it by writing up a plan. I'm going to do a series next month you're going to really like. It's, um, I call it PTSD thinking. It's, you got a plan. You got to have a team, you got to have self-confidence, and you have to have deadlines. That's all four sermons for next month. See, I'm ahead of the game. I'm telling you, I'm working. You got a plan. You need a plan as a senior. And you know, I have a plan. I'm working a plan right now. Uh, there's a goal for me. I have a team. I have people so, that, I, that are helping me. Uh, and I have, and this is part of it. You see me doing more Bible studies. You see me doing that. And I got some other stuff I plan on coming on down the road I'm working on. Um, and I, I'm, I'm confident. I believe I can do it. And I have deadlines. Say that big word. Come on. Deadlines. See, talking is one thing. Launching is another. So that's my answer. So on that, in terms of deadline, thinking about time, can you speak to the idea of how do you give people, you know, do you put a timeline in terms of giving them opportunity to change? How much time do you give people to change? Especially if they're in your house or whatever, they're not going to change. You know, one of the things about, about waiting to do things is you don't know how much time you have. So I, I'm a big do it now person. I'm a big confront it now person. I, anybody that works for me, anybody in church, if you're doing something and in, in, in you're in leadership and I don't know about it, that's the reason I didn't say anything to you. Keep hiding, because if I find out about it, I'm going to say something to you. The day I find out about it. And I'm going to be nice, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let people do stuff like you see Eli doing, his kids doing. Not that I know about it. And people are good at hiding. I know I've been past a long time. They're professionals. But I believe that you have to act now. The moment you hear my voice, heart, not your heart, you know, I think you have to act now. Do it now. Start. Go in that direction. You don't have to get all the way there, but just go in that direction. That makes sense? Say amen. All right. Uh, is there more questions before we go? I like that. Jewel, you like that PTSD thinking. I see. That's good. That's Jewel. Everybody say, hello, Jewel. Hello, Jewel. See, we see you, girl. We know she's amazing. She and her whole family is amazing. I won't tell you about Jewel. She's, she's cool beans. One last yes. question for closing. Sure. You mentioned about having a worshipful life. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate just a little bit more in closing on what a worshipful life looks like? In closing, let me say this to you. A worshipful life is, is 
a private way you engage God that works for you. Uh, for me, it's um, late night jamming to worship music with nobody around me, just me. And I go from song to song to song to song to song. Um, it's praying, it's communicating with God about things that I feel um, really, really good about and personal about. I pray about my issues, I pray about my anger, my concerns. If I'm frustrated, I lay it all before God. And I, I like it. And it's as long as I want or as short as I want. And it's really helpful to me. So that's my personal response. You've been great. I told you an hour and some change, right? Three minutes. That's okay. Did you enjoy tonight? Yeah. Come on, did you enjoy it? All right. Now, here's the deal. We're the same thing, part two, next week. It's going to be live. They're going to send out a link. And they're going to, and if you don't, if you, here's what you can do. If you don't get the link, if you're wondering, pastor at overcoming by faith. What's my email? Pastor at overcoming by faith dot org. Pastor at overcoming by faith dot org. But we're going to also have a link and, and it's going to be on stream. It's going to be on streaming too. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's going to be on streaming. It's going to be all the, all the normal places. I'm sorry that it normally is. So, but if you don't, if you can't find it, you can email me and say, where is it? Where is it? And then we'll have the staff help you find it. But you can, but we stream and you'll be able to see everything. Hey, Michael McKenzie, good to see you. Tell your family I say hello. I want you to know that we're going to have a great time. It's going to be tremendous. It's going to be great. And it's going to be the next two sermons are going to be online. We've got to keep our online muscles strong and our in-person muscles strong. I am working on some more in-person stuff for you. And I'm looking forward to it. Remember, this third Sunday in this month is for married folks. i got a married session. It's going to be 11 o'clock on the third Sunday. That's our special um, gathering service. It's going to be really nice. And if you're not married, don't worry. It's going to be good stuff still on. I see that some people looking at me frowning like, hey, well, what about us? We just had one for y'all last, last month. Had a whole singles thing last month. So we got a lot. Let's all stand. Time's up. You know me. I, I got. And, and say what, what now? Brunch and books. Brunch and books is Saturday. That's online and in person, too. And we're going to go over the book on um, the War of the Mind with uh, Craig Rochelle. It's going to be a really fun discussion, more dialogue. That's going to be 11 o'clock on this Saturday morning, okay, in person and in, in, in line. Anybody who's coming to brunch and books, raise your hand. You're coming. You know you're coming. Let me see you. Okay, good. Y'all come out and get y'all. It's going to be good brunch. You'll love it. I don't know what they got, but it's, it's good. It's pan, what is it? Uh, waffles and... and uh, it's a different menu. It's a, it's a different menu. I don't know, but it's good. Good breakfast. So come on, get it. All right? And it's free, so you can't be arguing about it. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for being with us tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to be in the Word of God tonight. We pray that this has been helpful and inspirational. We ask your blessing upon it. We pray that we leave today both in person and online with a strong commitment to grow and to learn and to apply these truths. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen.